before it was a sport, it was about life and death. So no real martial artist could simply focus on physical skill alone. Hey there, welcome. You are listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 672, with my guest today, Mr. Dan Millman. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, host for the show, founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to see everything we do, go to whistlekick.com. That's where you'll find all the stuff that we're working on. And one of the things we've got over there, well, it's our store. One of the ways that we pay the bills here, we make and sell stuff. And if you use the code PODCAST15, you can save 15% off the stuff that we sell. Martial Arts Radio gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you the show twice a week. And our goal here at Whistlekick and really of the show and, and I guess just everything we're working on is to connect and educate and entertain traditional martial artists of the world. If you want to support the work that we do, you've got a bunch of options. You could buy something, like I said, you could... Maybe grab one of our books on Amazon. But if you want to see the full list, all the things you could do, some cost money, most of them don't, whistlekick.com slash family. If you are part of the Whistlekick family, head on over to that page and check out all the ways you can help us in our mission to reach, grow, support the traditional martial arts. One of the things we reference over there, it is an important aspect of what we do. It's our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. If you think the shows that we bring you are worth 63 cents a piece, then consider supporting us at $5. And we're actually going to give you a bunch of stuff back. We're going to give you a ton of exclusive content. We're going to send you physical rewards in the mail. Thank yous for your support. Again, the details there, patreon.com slash whistlekick or go to whistlekick.com slash family and grab the link. If you've been listening to this show for a long time, you know that my favorite aspect of martial arts is the foundation it provides for personal growth. Today's guest is well-known in the world of personal growth, and a good portion of my attitude in that direction comes from today's guest. Mr. Dan Millman is an internationally recognized writer, speaker, seminar host, and so much more. He has spent a good portion of his life sharing his information with others. And if you've read any of his books, you know the power of his words. I was honored to have the opportunity to sit down and chat with him. We had a wonderful conversation and you get to listen to it. Here it is. Dan Millman, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you, Jeremy. Good to be here with you. It's it's great to have you. It, You know, the show itself is about six what are we six and a half years old i've known some of the guests that have come on for a long time but there's nobody that's come on whom i've known of for a longer delta between knowing who they were and getting to talk to them so this is kind of exciting for me so thank you for the honor of your time oh my pleasure really now Some of the folks who are listening may know your name, but they're probably not going to know much about you and your relationship to martial arts. I know you've you've talked bits about it. You've hinted at it. Anybody who's familiar with your work knows that that has been a part of your journey. But this is our opportunity to really kind of go deeper onto it. And that's what I'm excited about. So let's start here. If we think about when you started martial arts, there must have been a point before that where you were aware of martial arts. Do you remember your first, let's say, memory of awareness of martial arts and that it existed? I do, as a matter of fact. And my entree to the martial arts began maybe as many young people's uh, time in the martial arts began. I faced some childhood bullies Hmm. when I was um, eight, nine, ten years old in elementary school and middle school primarily. And after several encounters, I asked my dad if I could learn some self-defense. And even though I'm known by many people as a former gymnast, people who've seen the Peaceful Warrior movie based on my first book, sure. they, uh, I actually began martial arts before gymnastics. Uh, my 
anyway, my father took me to um, a boxing gym he knew of, where I quickly discovered I didn't really like getting hit or hitting other people. So I didn't pursue as a 10-year-old, or maybe it was a nine-year-old, but I didn't pursue boxing. Um, and then he took me to, um, uh, in a Japanese uh, uh, part of town, uh, uh, my first judo dojo. So judo, the gentle way, was my, my first introduction to the arts. And uh, very good teachers. Uh, I loved learning rolling and uh, falling and, and the various throws. So I, that was my first study mm-hmm. I went several times a week. Um, and in fact, there was a big red haired giant, but guy, big hearted guy. He let the kids throw him around. His name was Gene LaBelle, <laughs> whom I think you've probably heard of and many of you listeners have. I, the I, grand I know, old man I know of, Mr. LaBelle. Yes. Yes. Uh, great guy. So I was exposed to him early on. And, uh, in my first tournament, um, I tried a tomoe nage, which is like a circle throw where you lay, lay backward and put your foot on someone's stomach and grab their lapel and you know, throw them over your hand. Mm. Um, it used to be used in the movies a lot. It looked good. And it didn't work very well for me. This uh, young boy my age was uh, heavier than I was, and, and my foot slipped and he fell on top of me and, and uh, pinned me. And that was, <laughs> that was my exposure to my first martial arts experience in uh, competition which I actually surprisingly didn't really care for much. I love the training. I love the terms and, and the roles and the philosophy as much as one 10-year-old can absorb. Mm. Um, so that was my first exposure. And, and the way I discovered judo was in our neighborhood, um, there were, in Los Angeles, there were many, uh, many Hispanic and, and uh, Asian uh, people. And where we used to play up in a forest um, of trees was taken down and there was a Japanese cultural center built there mm-hmm. right up our street. And so I was exposed to things Japanese. And my first role model, he was a streetwise kid. He was about 13 and I was only 10. His name was Steve Yusoff. And so I used to see Japanese dolls in his house, these, these geishas, and uh, there were other artifacts. There was a samurai sword. So I, I was kind of exposed to Eastern thought, Japanese particularly, and judo early on. And um, I'm not going to go into that much detail because we've all had our history in the arts, either training in one art or sure, many. Sure. Um, but I did later on uh, take some uh, karate with my cousin. And uh, in high school, I got pretty in, in immersively involved with Okinawate, a man named Gordon Diversova. Uh, whether someone has heard of Gordon or not, uh, uh, he actually choreographed that first fight scene in the original movie, The Manchurian Candidate, maybe you remember that? Yeah. Was one of the earlier good martial arts fight scenes. Frank Sinatra, I believe. Uh, was Some have called it the first martial arts fight scene on film in, in the well, modern I, era. I, I think uh, James Cagney did some judo in one of his earlier films. Okay. He might have been one of the first time right. an Asian martial art was used uh, other than just fight, fist fight. Sure. Um, but yes, it was an early one and it was a, one of the better fight teams. So Gordon choreographed that, but still he was an excellent teacher. I learned the 108 move falling leaf form and Okinawan martial arts, as many of your listeners know, blend the, uh, um, linear style of, of Japan karate and, uh, and the more circular, uh, Chinese uh, wushu type, mm-hmm. uh, Kung Fu form. Uh, so it's a very interesting style, and I just happened to be exposed to that in high school. Then I had a latency period of 10 years where I, I didn't really do martial arts, um, um, but I did get a seventh degree black belt on the trampoline uh, <laughs> uh, because I was I got into gymnastics. In fact, the first day in gymnastics, cl- uh, there was a club, a tumbling and trampoline club uh, in my middle school. My homeroom teacher started it. And he asked if anyone could demonstrate a roll. And I, my hand shot up. I was so enthusiastic. And what I did was my judo roll. And I was very embarrassed when he said, oh, well, actually, in, in acrobatics, we do a roll directly forward over our head. Yeah. So I learned the difference between those types of rolling. And I've learned many others, of course, since. And later on, after I started coaching at Stanford University in gymnastics, I took up Aikido. Uh, I ended up getting a Shodan um, certificate. So now if I'm ever attacked on the street, I can whip out my certificate. 
Um, maybe give someone a paper cut. Sure. Um, sure. But so I was still, I consider myself a real beginner uh, in, in Aikido. But I love the, the philosophy, the physical movement of non resistance, getting out of the way. And, and of course, that's a principle for any art. Um, but the circular motions and, and the, the friendliness of it. Um, and every every art has its strengths and, and liabilities. I, I once asked my Aikido sensei, um, Robert Nadeau, uh, who taught George Leonard, who was well known for his philosophy and is an author. Um, uh, anyway, uh, I asked him, you know, can can, uh, can you really learn to defend yourself like on the street with Aikido? And this was before Steven Seagal. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he, he said in his grumbling kind of uh, raspy voice, uh, you want to get self-defense, get a piece, you know, get a gun. <laughs> so um, he was very practical in his approach, but then he body slammed me to the mat, I guess, to make a point. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but after that, I, I took up Tai Chi, learned the uh, hundred move, uh, 108 move form on both sides, right and left. And, um, uh, I, I also dabbled with the basics of Kali, Eskrima, Arnis, the Filipino arts, um, in order to teach uh, a personal growth training for 14 years, We're using uh, knife fighting as a means of self-knowledge and personal growth and making some shifts. It's a great metaphor. Um, and, and finally, I guess one of the, the most interesting arts I've ever studied uh, a fellow who was really good at Poxilat, he was an instructor, 27 years doing mm. very fast, named Al McLucky. Um, he lives in the Midwest. And Al said, Dan, I just took a seminar with this guy named Vladimir Vasilyev uh, and this thing called Sistema, and I'd never heard of it. But he said, you, you really want to do this. So I ended up flying to Toronto, training with Vladimir a bit for a couple of weeks, I'm really sore. But again, it's not a macho art, but it's very demanding. Uh, physically, and it was tremendous experience. Uh, and later, I went to Moscow with the Sistema Group and trained with uh, Mikhail Rabko, who was one of uh, uh, Vladimir's colleagues and, and teachers as well. Yeah. Uh, he's amazing. I, I, uh, I've heard that we've had a few folks on the show who've trained directly with him, and they they have nothing but amazing things to say. Well, you know, there's a saying about uh, Kuichi Tohei and Aikido, and also uh, Ueshiba. Uh, Sensei, the, mm. the founder of Aikido, they said the difference between Tohei and Ueshiba is with Tohei, you feel like you're trying to move a mountain. With Osensei, Ueshiba, it's like trying to move a feather and not being able to do it. So there's a certain different quality. And Vladimir is an amazing uh, practitioner of Sistema, um, as he's demonstrated many times with challengers. Um, Ryabko doesn't even look like he's fighting. He, he just he just isn't there when you try to attack him and you're you're pinned and thrown and whatever. He, he's amazing. Well, you've probably heard stories about that. But I'm just sharing a bit about my experience, yeah. you know, in the arts. So Sistema and I went later to a training camp uh, north of uh, Toronto, Canada, where we were fighting in the water and uh, in open spaces and forest at night. All kinds of uh, interesting environments, testing our intuition, all that sort of thing. Yeah. So I, I owe a, a great debt to the martial arts. Um, and the reason I mention this is because, as many people know, not everyone, I wrote a book called Way of the Peaceful Warrior, and it's, it's become quite popular over the last, well, since 1980, um, when it first came out in hardback. And... Some people, you know, said, well, why do you use the term warrior? You were a gymnast, weren't you? So at least I had some grounding in the martial arts. I wouldn't say depth, but I did have breadth, a sense of perspective about the strengths and uh, you know, limitations of various arts uh, and, and the understanding how self-defense is different from martial arts. Uh, there's martial science, martial art. Uh, I also trained with... Uh, Matthew Thomas, who started model mugging, you may have heard of that self-defense system mm -hmm. where the guys wear these overalls and heavily padded and, and uh, they teach full contact uh, uh, reality-based scenarios. And, yeah. and that evolved into fast defense. Fast stands for fear, adrenal, stress training with a recognition that when you're under high stress, the fancy moves don't work. 
You need high percentage shots, uh, large muscle groups, and and it's very practical. It was the best self defense training per se I'd ever had. A fellow named Bill Kip, former uh, ranger, um, and many many years in the martial arts, uh, uh, was trained by Matt and then uh, evolved it further. So anyway, yeah. that's the background. So I can talk with at least some authority about uh, the idea of warriorhood, uh, Budo, Bushido, and the philosophy. To me, I was an athlete and I, I appreciated sports. In sports, you can lose a point. You can lose a match. Uh, in, in martial arts, it, it comes from a more sincere lineage where before it was a sport, it was about life and death. So no real martial artist could simply focus on physical skill alone if the emotions were in turmoil and the mind distracted. So I think there was a holistic sort of training from the beginning in martial arts uh, where you had to train body, mind, emotion, spirit. Yeah. And, and that's one thing I appreciate, that lineage of the arts. And, and it's really about life. You know, it's funny, in The Karate Kid, Pat Morita could get away with his character. You know, Mr. Miyagi could say, Karate! like life. And that's it. I mean, the, the road, the difference between expertise and mastery, in my view, is in expertise, you become physically skilled. But mastery, even on beginning levels, if someone recognizes my training is really a training for life hmm. through the art, whatever that art may be, um, they're on the path of mastery. And that's what connects it all up, I think. And, and so, uh, if this isn't too long a monologue, I also Keep going. want to share. Keep going. Okay. Um, I was uh, a, an assistant professor of physical education at Oberlin College after my coaching career mm -hmm. at Stanford University for four years. I coached the top U.S. Olympian, Leach, uh, turned the team into one of the top three teams in the U.S. Uh, in about three and a half years. And then I left to be do more creative work, in, in a sense, at Oberlin College. I taught courses like psychophysical development and mirthful movement, a circus course, juggling and teeterboard and acrobatics and so on. Um, but I created a course that uh, introduced students to both Tai Chi, the basic elements of Tai Chi, and Aikido. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was going to call it, for the catalog, I was going to call it the way of the warrior which makes a lot of sense. We understand way, meaning do or dao, um, a path to excellence and, and so on through training. Um, but it didn't quite fit because these are more, a bit more internal arts. Um, and they, they were not primarily aggressive arts, but defensive, on, on both of them. Uh, sure. And so I ended up coming up with the idea, I said, wait a minute, I'll call it Way of the Peaceful Warrior. And this was the first time that I organically came up with the term. Um, and it was only years later when I wrote the book that I, I said, hey, you know, what is this book going to be about? It's like a lot of things, living in the present and, and so on and so forth. And, and I said, I'll call it The Way of the Peaceful Warrior. And, and that it stuck. Uh, and that's another story. But that, that kind of connects up for those who don't know my work, how I came up with the term peaceful warrior. And I, I probably should mention that I view everyone as a peaceful warrior in training. And what I mean by that is it's not some namby-pamby, new agey kind of uh, you know, label. Um, I've never seen anybody who isn't striving to live with a, with a peaceful heart, uh, to live with a sense of serenity, equanimity uh, in the amidst the chaos of the daily news and the challenges of everyday life. But also there are times we need to acknowledge that there are times we need a warrior's spirit. And it's not necessarily about combat, except in the sense of the inner battle that sometimes goes on with demons of insecurity, and, you know, fear of one kind or another, anxiety, uh, self-doubt. Um, but really, it's about standing up tall inside of ourselves and marching into life, rolling up our sleeves and tackling what we need to face uh, in everyday life. And we all face adversity, um, sometimes small, sometimes major, loss, grief, challenge, and so on. 
uh, illness, accidents, you know, various kinds of physical, emotional, and mental pain. Um, we've all had it. And so this is why I view all of us as peaceful warriors in training in the school of everyday life. So the term isn't some exclusive club you can join. You don't have to get some special initiation to become a peaceful warrior. It, it applies to human beings on planet Earth, which I view as a divine school for souls. Daily life is our classroom. So I, I hope that it, uh, it gives a, a sense of a context of where I'm coming from. Sure, sure. And there are about 100 directions that we could go and, and questions swimming in my head, which one to choose first. So. I think I've got the one and, and we're going to, we're going to roll back a little bit. You talked about boxing, not quite resonating for you, but you're talking about this cultural center. You're talking about Japanese arts, Okinawan arts. You're talking about experience with uh, historical cultural elements, even outside of training. And then for anyone who's read wave, the peaceful warrior, which, which I did for the first time quite a long time ago, your approach even to your gymnastics training reminded me of martial arts training, just that mindset. So I'm curious because we found over the years that when someone tries martial arts and finds something that works for them, something that's sticky, there's a reason, there's an element. Maybe it was something that was missing, something that they were dreaming of, whatever it is. So do you have a sense as to what it was when you first found judo that was clicking for you, at least better than the boxing was? Huh. Good, good, uh, good question. Some of it is just serendipity uh, and good fortune. Uh, they happened to be in our, near our neighborhood. My father was willing to take me. Um, it was traditional. Mm -hmm. uh, the instructors were Japanese, uh, along with Gene, I think, who helped some, but he just went and trained there with us. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that I made a conscious choice at 10 years old to, to find an art that resonated with me. Um, and, and later, by the way, I did a little bit of boxing again. I, I dropped into Peter Ralston's, uh, uh, in Berkeley, his, his place in Oakland. Sure. And, and, uh, um, again, found out I really didn't like getting hit much. <laughs> I got hit a lot because these guys were much faster and better than I was. Um, um. Whereas judo was more friendly. I used to like to wrestle as a kid and try to get out of holds. I mean, if I discovered Brazilian jiu-jitsu, which I'm going to introduce my grandson to in, in uh, maybe a couple of weeks, uh, once things quiet down as far as, you know, our current situation uh, sure. and gyms, um, I probably would have liked that very much. Um, but... There was something about just moving with someone and, and trying to use leverage. That's what impressed me. You see, I'd never heard of judo, but I saw that exhibition at the Japanese Cultural Center, and I saw kids and small people throwing larger people. And I'd always been small for my age, and, and I was the young, one of the youngest kids in my class. I started school early with kindergarten, and from then on, I was one of the younger ones. Uh, I explain all this in, in my new memoir called Peaceful Heart, warrior spirit appropriately um so seeing how yet smaller people could throw larger ones i said i, I want some of that uh <laughs> so th that's probably what attracted me to to try uh, judo it wasn't overall size and strength but to a large degree leverage uh and, and that's why i was i was attracted to that and and again, you you said, Jeremy, that many people, you know, follow one art for a long time because they resonate with it. Um, there are people who pick one thing and go in depth and continue it for many, many years, even decades. And my interest somehow, instinctively, it was not conscious, really. I just like to be exposed to different kinds of approaches, to movement, uh, to self-expression, as Bruce Lee used to say. Uh, and so it gave me an appreciation for the various arts and their strengths and, and so on. Uh, I get that. Gave me a sense of discernment about the different arts. Uh, and by the way, one of the one of the prime um, principles in this approach to living that I teach, called the Peaceful Warrior's Way, is that there is no best martial art, mm -hmm. no best teacher, no best book, 
no best religion, no best philosophy or path or diet or system of exercise. There's only the best for each of us at a given time of our life. So I have a respect for people's individual choices and their process. And when I'm asked by people, and I am uh, fairly often, uh, Dan, can you recommend a martial art for me to study? I'd say, well, yeah, look, you know, Google what's near you, first of all, because I can tell you a great school is 300 miles away. It's not going to be very practical. Sure. Um, and second, find a really good teacher where the students seem to be having a, a really good time. They're getting a lot out of it. Uh, sample a class, observe, uh, and also partake. And pick a teacher that you resonate with. The style perhaps is less relevant um, than, than the teacher. Uh, some teachers teach an art or a subject in school. Others teach life through the art, through the teacher. And that's what I would look for. I, I'm smiling. I suspect a number of the listeners are laughing because you're hitting all the points that I hit when that subject comes up. You know, people lead with style. No, no, that's the least important. Of all the things you can you can go through, it's pretty much the least important. And just as you said, where are you? When do you want to train? What's your what's your reason for training? Things like that. Yeah. Now, you're, you're talking about your entry to martial arts with, with some passion, with some some conviction, and yet you set it down for gymnastics, which makes me wonder did you see gymnastics as something completely different or maybe something that had far more similarity than, than maybe someone who hasn't been a gymnast might notice? Well, I, strangely enough for a national and world champion on the trampoline to say, but I've never really liked competition. Very much. Uh, <laughs> okay. I like I like collaboration. I like working with people. I also tended toward individual uh, endeavors, where my success didn't depend on someone else's failure. Um, and that's more of a philosophical response to your question, Jeremy. But actually, what happened was after my exposure to judo. Uh, now, now, by the way, the, I should mention, uh, let me take a step back. Okay. The first physical discipline I was exposed to, other than, you know, kids running, throwing frisbees, playing baseball and all that, um, the first discipline that I studied was modern dance. I was about no, nine years old, I think, before I, I took judo. Um, my mother played the piano for a modern dance class, and she didn't want to pay for a babysitter. So... She brought me and enrolled me in the class. It was me, you can imagine, a nine-year-old boy and about 10 or 12 girls yeah. uh, I, in tights. And, and they were wearing tutus. I refused that, of course. <laughs> but um, I learned to point my toes. I learned muscular control. I learned about movement. And that was a great foundation for all the physical disciplines I did afterward. Um, so that was the first thing I was exposed to. But also, about that age, I was at a summer camp, summer day camp, going with my cousin and my sister. And she loved horses. She did horses. My cousin did other things. She liked to swim. But I discovered an old, really heavy-duty trampoline, ground-level trampoline. Never had seen that kind of thing before. But when I started jumping on it, it allowed me to jump, you know, like a kangaroo, higher than I could on the ground. And to most people today, you know, backyard trampolines are all around, everybody knows. But it was more rare, it was more circus thing back then. And so it was rare to find that. And I just spent all my time jumping on that trampoline, trying to do seat drops, belly drops, back drops. And I wanted to learn to flip. And I was an autodidact, you know, that term. I was trying to teach myself. And I kept trying to figure out how to spin around. Um, and by the, just before one of the, the, the summer camp ended, I did... Um, such a well-timed front somersault that I was trying to get all the way around on my feet. Well, I missed my feet entirely, landed on my face, scraped my whole face up. I got scabs everywhere, and but it didn't even dampen my enthusiasm. However, I didn't discover another trampoline uh, until a couple of years later, again, 
when my homeroom teacher in middle school, the first day, said, I'm starting a trampoline tumbling club. And boy, I was, there was something about it. I just knew I had to do it. I needed to. So I was so enthusiastic. And I, the previous story I told about doing the roll over my shoulder um, and the embarrassment uh, led to, to some, a lot of learning. Handstands, headstands, cartwheels, uh, back handsprings. I, I even learned to stand on my instructor's shoulders on the trampoline, jump off his shoulders, land on the trampoline, do a backflip, and land back on his shoulders. And this was, you know, I was 11 years old, just starting wow. middle school. Um, and that immersed me. I mean, it just completely drew me. And there's more. To, I tell more of the story uh, in, in the memoir, but. Um, I ended up just getting better and better. And I was uh, doing trampolining in a center in Burbank, California. Um, and uh, I ended up winning the state championship. Uh, I was 14 years old and the rest were college students. If anybody wants to look me up on life, I was on the cover of Life magazine with some friends. Oh, no Nin oh, cool. May 1960, um, the trampoline craze was beginning. There were backyard trampoline centers opening up everywhere around 1960. And so Life Magazine took an interest and they had a picture of me and a bunch of friends doing some trampoline in midair um, on that cover of Life Magazine. And inside, the 14-year-old Danny Millman was doing demonstrating some flips with strobe lights going off. Um, and the trampoline oh, right. led to tumbling, which led to gymnastics events in high school and, and a scholarship to UC Berkeley um, eventually. So... I was just immersed in gymnastics, and, and I liked it. I, there was no fighting. I didn't have to get punched or hurt. I fell a lot. I mean, I showed a certain toughness that, that uh, one can evoke in, uh, in the martial arts, but it was with the apparatus. It was you know, showing spirit and determination and falling again and again. But I think my early exposure to judo you know, made me comfortable falling, and I never minded. But I used to fail 50 times a day, you know, crashing until I learned the move. And so failure was a totally different critter to me. Many people fear it, but I was so used to failing. I failed my way to success. Mm -hmm. That's how I trained in, in gymnastics. Uh, but, but yet, when I started coaching, I, I wasn't doing gymnastics anymore. So that, then I thought, of, hey, maybe I can uh, do some more training in the martial arts. And that's when I happened to find a local school in Aikido, and one of the foremost uh, teachers, you know, I asked him, I said, you know, Nado is a, like a French name. I said, are you any good at this? <laughs> <laughs> I actually had the husband ask him that. And then he said, well, you know, the Uchi Deshi, I trained with uh, the founder in Japan after the war. Um, and he used to tell me they, they trained on hardwood floors and with nails sticking up, you know, they hadn't been pounded in properly. Um, it was tough training. And you probably mm -hmm. know this. The beginnings of a lot of martial arts, uh, they only attract the toughest guys. Uh, and, and later, they're, they're more, when they reach out to more people, they, they soften somewhat. Uh, and then, of course, later they become sports, even though Aikido never became a sport. Um, it's interesting so, to think of uh, something like Aikido, which is seen so gently, so peaceful. Think of thinking of it in terms of uh, rough around the edges, in a sense. You you talked about this transition from martial arts to gymnastics, and and you know we can imagine the things that you bring from martial arts to gymnastics. But I'm I'm also interested about that that secondary transition. What was it you took from gymnastics into Aikido? Yeah, well, <laughs> not all good things. For example, when I began doing the Aikido moves, you know, I, first of all, I was into perfection. Mm -hmm. symmetry um, and control. But when you're dealing with another unpredictable partner, even though you know in Aikido they tend to have very rehearsed kind of uh, attacks and defenses, yeah. um, ritualized almost, uh, but still they kept telling me, relax, Dan, relax. And I was like, I am relaxed. <laughs> uh, because I was used to doing iron crosses and the rings, you know, and planges and all those straight moves and um, and so I had to unlearn uh, the idea of being totally in control and start to flow and, and relax and extend energy and key and 
Um, that would have, if I'd returned to gymnastics after martial arts, it would have been uh, even better. And, and one fed the other. So it took me a while to overcome the whole control thing in gymnastics and learn to just flow and, and relate to my partner uh, in that way. Because I was used to being such an individual. Even though we had a team, we each did our individual routines. And so working with another person uh, took, uh, took some adjustment. Uh, but yes, definitely the concentration, the focus, um, uh, the spirit that I learned in training for gymnastics uh, did carry over later to, to the, uh, the martial arts of Aikido and the others that I practiced. So one thing, you know, it's physical movement. You know, we have words, we have yoga, we have football, baseball, sports, martial arts, acrobatics. But what does it all have in common? Movement. Movement, attention, stillness, and uh, and focus. Mm. Dynamism, a certain dynamism. So it's really all about movement, expressing yourself again, and through these different physical disciplines. But really, they're psychophysical disciplines. As any martial artist knows, you have to have a certain uh, mental ability. Of course. Uh, if you will, and, and spirit. You know, in some of my Peaceful Warrior seminars, the long ones, like weekend workshops, sometimes we do board breaking. And it, it's, uh, but we do it as a metaphor, uh, not as learning to punch hard or kick hard or whatever. And, and it's a very powerful metaphor, I've found, and it's been used by many people. Um, and I tell this when I train people how to, how to do it, you know, how to break the board, uh, the techniques and so on, I say, uh, I can teach you the technique. I'm responsible for teaching you the proper technique to maximize your chances of going through this board. Um, but I said, the spirit part is up to you. And I can usually tell who's going to break the board because, you know, if they had the eyes of the tiger, they were going right through that board. And I, I tell the story in, in, in Peaceful Heart, Warrior Spirit, in the memoir, that once I was uh, down in Texas, in Austin, in the hill country, a place called Crossings, and I was teaching a weekend workshop there, and we, we kind of did a thing on Sunday morning, Awaken the Warrior Spirit. It wasn't a martial arts training, mind you. It's a peaceful warrior training about training the mind, doing some uh, different kind of workout, breathing exercises, and so on. But on Sunday, we did the board breaking. And normally, when I ask for a volunteer, uh, after I train them how to do it, I say, who wants to be first? Normally, some larger guy, you know, maybe a martial artist who has some experience will come up first confidently and they want to show their stuff. So, but this time, this tiny, diminutive woman came up, an elder woman, and she uh, introduced herself as Maggie. And she said, uh, she told me several things. First, she said, uh, today is my 79th birthday. Uh, she said, I, I, I'm right-handed, but I've injured my right hand, so I'm going to have to use my left hand. And, and I've never done this before. Well, <laughs> um, when Maggie knelt down to bring her hand through that board, and it was, it was at that time I used the usual traditional pine board, you know, dried pine board. Anyway, I looked in her eyes because I was on the other side of her. I could see her eyes, and I knew this lady was going to go through that board. And she just, bam, like knife through butter, which surprised me, actually, because it is easier for people with larger mass to do it. Sure. And I only learned later that she was a student of Cheng Man Ching, um, and she had been teaching Tai Chi in New York City for uh, probably 20 years at that time. <laughs> She's still alive. Uh, at the time of this interview, but she's really getting on in, in age right now, probably in her 90s. Um, so maybe that had something to do with it. It sounds like it. Yeah. When when you put together, whether it's it's a, a new book or, you know, one of these these seminars, these events, you know, it. I think anybody who's trained can understand, you know, you're, you're never going to be able to separate the training, you know, the training is, is part of you, your gymnastics training is part of you, your Aikido, your system, all it's all part of you. But you do have a choice as to what of that context for who you are, goes into whatever it is you're bringing forward, whether, you know, book, uh, an event. 
And you've written a number of books and they, they, they come in at, at different angles. They bring in different elements of who you are and, and thus, in my mind, different parts of your martial arts uh, context, we'll call it. How do you make that decision? Because, and, and let, let me add a part B real quick, because your audience is not a martial arts specifically audience. Yes, I, I do have uh, quite a, a following, I believe, over the years when I've taught seminars, the number of people who've been involved with the martial arts. So I think people involved with the martial arts may, may gravitate toward a book called The Way of the Peaceful Warrior, uh, anything with the word warrior in it. Um, in the broader capacity of that. Sure. Um, so I'm not sure whether you're asking me what moved me to write my various books. Mm. No, it's, it's, it's not that it's in, in the creative process. I, I would, so, so this, this memoir, I'm, I'm going to guess the memoir starts with a kind of a big idea, a macro idea, and then you decide how you're going to fill that in. Ah, uh, okay. And so well, that's, that's the, an the ingredients, question. which, how do you yeah. choose the martial arts ingredients? Right. You know, there is, at one point in my career, after writing about 16, 15 books yeah. over like 35 years, um, I decided it was time to give back to writing and, and, and share what I learned uh, about the art of writing. And so I, I wrote the first draft, showed it to my daughter, who, who I used to edit her papers, but then she passed me in terms of writing ability. Uh, and, and she said, Dad, this is really meandering, uh, <laughs> this, this literary advice. She said, let me take a crack at it. And I said, that would be great. We ended up uh, co-publishing this book. Well, it was published by her established publisher, but the book is called The Creative Compass, Writing Your Way from Inspiration to Publication. And she structured it around five universal stages of the creative process. And I hadn't really thought about it, how it might apply to martial arts, but I know it applies to any creative art. Mm -hmm. And the five stages of creating a, a book, a painting, a sculpture, a musical composition, and maybe even some innovative martial arts the first stage is dreaming. In other words, you come up with an idea, an approach, some innovation. But that where it is, is the life of the mind, in the imagination. So that's the dreaming phase. And it has to start there. Then the next step, the next phase, is drafting. In writing, it's putting it down. It's bringing what was unmanifest and into reality on a computer screen, on a page. And drafting is like muscular effort. It's like laying a brick wall 100 miles long. Just one word, one sentence, one paragraph at a time. And the next stage is the one most people skip. It's called development. Maybe you've heard in the movie-making business, they call it development hell. It's when you step back and say, is my creation, what was a castle in my mind, right now kind of looks like a garden shed. And so it's time to renovate and, and restructure and test it against reality. Is this what I wanted to express? And so that's what most people skip. They jump to the fourth level, the fourth stage, which is refinement, polishing, refining it, uh, and so on. And finally, of course, the sharing with other people, mm. teaching, learning, sharing, growing. And this probably happens in the development of many martial arts. It, everything seems to go through these we didn't make up these stages. My daughter knew about them, but she wrote them in this way, and then we structured the whole book around that. Um, and, and each book goes through that process. An email that you want to compose carefully will go through that process. Uh, it's not just about writing, rewriting, and then you're done. So it goes through that whole idea of bringing it into the life, life of the mind, into manifest reality. Um, I mean, how did people come up with various techniques and, and, and uh, movements and counter-movements and it's a very, it can be very, very creative. Uh, obviously, uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu is, is very much like that. I met a young man once um, named Josh Waitzkin. And maybe uh, you recognize that name, but 
Josh, have you ever seen the movie Searching for Bobby Fisher? I'm familiar I, with the movie. I've never seen it. I highly recommend it. There's some of the best acting you'll ever see among the five, six ensemble people. It's a touching, uh, deep movie okay. um, about a young chess prodigy and how he discovers chess and discovers he loves it. And he's good at it. Um, the Queen's Gambit is a more recent uh, and more popular kind of movie mm -hmm. uh, about chess. And again, chess, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, it's all about strategy, right? Uh, and figuring things out. And, and, and well, anyway, what's interesting about Josh is after he became a, 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 the, one of the youngest grandmasters um, ever in chess, he took up uh, push hands and he won the World Push Hands Championships in China against uh, some not very fair play sometimes. Mm. Um, but he won that championships. And then uh, later on, he took up uh, BJJ. Um, he opened a, a school with uh, Marcelo Garcia mm -hmm. um, in New York City. And so Josh has been doing that. I don't know what he's up to now, but he, he really was training. I went to see him roll, as they say, in uh, BJJ in, in, that, in a school in, uh, in New York City, where, where I now live. I haven't seen Josh in a while, but how many grandmasters in chess end up being uh, world class martial artists? You know, that, that's a bit unusual. But I, strategy, I would imagine few, but I bet any of them could. It's, it's a mindset. It's a it's a mindset. You're right. Absolutely. Unpacking a puzzle. Yes. Yes, it is. I don't know if I really responded to that that question, but that's what came up for me. <laughs> that, that's okay. The questions are just to to keep you talking. I we we don't have to go anywhere. I don't I don't have anything specific that we need to get through to call this uh, good or a success or done or anything like that. It's just it's us talking. It's us talking martial arts. And the beauty of the format is that everyone sees their relationship to martial arts and how it impacts their lives differently. And I yes. like the variability of that because the people who are listening have different relationships to martial arts. Some of them are school owners. Some of them are dipping their toe in and, and went to their first class. Some of them haven't even started yet, but they feel an affinity for it and they want to, and, and, and they're, they're hoping to get there soon. Yes. So to, to hear your stories is meaning because let, let me, please. let me say something about, I, I only referred briefly to studying uh, the basic elements of Kali Arnisa Screma yeah. uh, in order to teach a training I taught for 14 years called the Courage Training, the Peaceful Warrior Courage Training. Mm -hmm. And it involved teaching the basic movements, the first five attacks in Kali, um, of, of uh, first knife attacks, uh, angular attacks, you know, level attacks, and uh, thrusts. And in doing these movements, everyone learning the movements, uh, we worked a lot in slow motion. We emphasized deep relaxation while movement. And we got some amazing results. Now, uh, I could only take 40 people maximum, and people came from all over the world to do this training. Um, and it got a reputation of, of a certain kind. Um, it was a, a three and a half, let's say four day training an immersive training from before breakfast in the morning till uh, bedtime at night mm -hmm. um, in a retreat center in, in Northern California. And I don't teach it anymore. It's so intensive. I needed a staff and it just yeah. got unwieldy for after a while. But for 14 years, I didn't teach it. Now, the people who showed up to this training, most were absolute beginners in the martial arts. They'd never done a martial art before. But we got results um, well, actually, some of the people who came to the training were skilled martial arts, black belts. There was one fellow who was, um, I think he was, yeah, he was a seventh degree of black belt in Taekwondo. And another who was, had trained special forces and so on, they came not because they were going to learn new movements necessarily, but they were very curious about uh, reported results we got from this training. Mm. Remember, the training was not to teach people to fight with knives or to become expert martial artists in four days. What we did train, this the training led to a test. 
mm-hmm. at the end of the training. It was a culminating graduation ceremony. Some people passed the test, most did, some failed. And those who failed learned twice as much as those who passed. But it was about making fundamental shifts in their life reflected in the way they faced the fear in the form of three attackers coming at them one at a time in rapid succession. Uh, with steel knives, they were they were practice knives, they weren't sharp, but um, it was quite dry mouth, a high adrenal, uh, situational uh, challenge. Yeah. And one, the seventh degree black belt uh, failed his test the first time. And it wasn't because he didn't have the physical skill or strength or stamina. He was very good fighter. But he wasn't doing what we were looking for, is flowing with life. He, what The shift he needed to make was really relaxing and flowing with life more, being in relationship with us as we attacked. Um, and, but he tested a second time, and he did beautifully. He made that shift. It's quite dramatic when that happens. Now, the reason he took that training was to find out how we got the results we did. And what I mean by results is, it's usually pretty much the equivalent of training six months to even a year in most martial arts in terms of being able to move instinctively without thinking, mm. to trust the body to that degree where you don't think. You know, uh, one of my former mentors I, I describe in the, uh, in the memoir, in the Peaceful Heart Warrior Spirit, um, I call him the warrior priest. And he used to say, in combat, like in life, if you start thinking too much, you're dead. Hmm. And so they had to, if they were thinking and trying to figure out where we were going to come from next, it wouldn't work. They had to move absolutely instinctively and trust that. And that doesn't usually happen in four days, but it did in our training because of the slow motion we did and because of the relaxation and drilling again and again. Uh, we told people that usually you're confused. I don't know what I'm doing. And then you do it right once and you go, okay, I'm bored. Let's move on. <laughs> But we told them, no, that means you're just starting to get it. So we overtrained. And uh, people went through these confused places where they didn't know what they were doing. They were mentally confused, physically confused. Um, which, and, and yet, if they persisted, they made a breakthrough. Let me share a story, not about martial arts, but Please. about my 60th birthday. I wanted to do something different. So I ended up deciding I was going to learn to ride a unicycle. <laughs> and I had a kind of a stiff back at the time. But nonetheless, I wanted to learn to ride a unicycle. Now, I don't know, Jeremy, have you ever tried riding a unicycle? Once, and it did not go well. Okay, that's, that's the universal response, and it's very humbling. Yeah. Um, most people who've tried it, it's just like, what? How do people do this? Um, you know, I can ride a bike, but a unicycle is quite different. Um, so a friend of mine loaned me his unicycle. And told me to practice. He recommended a, a neighborhood tennis court early in the morning because mm-hmm. it's a good surface and I could get a death grip on the chain link fence mm-hmm. um, trying to ride around the perimeter uh, on this unicycle holding on. And at the end of every practice session, and I was there alone, um, I just would lean forward and careen and see how many times I could pedal before it, it went out from under me. And I practiced for a week and uh, I could get about six pedals before it went down. And then the second week, I actually think I got about almost 12 pedals, just like careening, though, not really riding. But by the end of the third week, I was able to ride figure eights around the tennis court. Now, now I came back every day. The reason I'm relating this story, and I think many martial artists or practitioners of anything will relate to this, I learned two things from learning to ride the unicycle. Uh, I relearned two things. First, everything is difficult until it becomes easy. Mm-hmm. True in any, any physical sure. form. But the even more important principle I learned was I confronted, there were a couple of days in those three weeks where everything fell apart. There were horrible days. I couldn't do anything. I was worse than I was three or four days before that. Confused mentally, physically. Yeah. But I came back. And usually, the day after those so-called bad days, I made a breakthrough, Hmm. sudden improvement. And I realized that the learning was actually happening 
on those bad days. That's when the, the skill level was going from my front brain, my precognitive level, to my back brain, more instinctive. And I think that applies to martial arts for sure. And it certainly oh, did to this knife definitely. fighting training. People were just going, freaking out. I don't know what I'm doing. I can't, I can't even move anymore. <laughs> but I said, stay with it, stay with it. And they made these breakthroughs. And people amazed themselves. We couldn't predict who would pass and who wouldn't. There was one guy had Chinese Tai Chi shoes, dressed all in black, perfect form. And when we attacked him, he just stood there and was <laughs> in place. And so we could never predict who was going to make a leap and rise mm. to the occasion and who wasn't. So it revealed a lot of people. It was, this is about self-knowledge, not just about learning to fight with a knife. But it really is a metaphor. And to me, martial arts are a metaphor of how to live wisely and well. Mm. I like it. Well, you've mentioned your book a couple of times, and, and it's it's coming out soon, uh, if I remember correctly, as of when we're recording this? Yes, when we're recording this. It, it, by the time it plays, I'm, I'm, I expect the book to be out. The official pub date's January 4th, um, 2022, you know. Coming up I, in a couple I, weeks. I think but this I, is I, scheduled for January third. So I think this will, you know, for for listeners who hit it the day of release, perfect tomorrow. Yeah, well, it's the book's officially published tomorrow. It'll be up on all the platforms. Okay. And I, I'm I'm not here like to promote the book because it may or may not be of interest. But sure, um, well, it is tell people point. about it so they can get a sense okay. as to whether or not they want to investigate. Sure. The subtitle of the book, "Peaceful Heart, Warrior Spirit," is the true story of my spiritual quest. And I believe we're all on a spiritual quest. Whether or not we might use that term or recognize it consciously, who isn't looking for a deeper sense of meaning and connection and purpose? Um, a sense we count for something. Asking, you know, where do I fit in life? What is it for? Um, maybe we don't think about that all the time. We're too busy with the conventional things of everyday life, as we ought to be. Uh, kids, education, training, work, and so on, uh, making a living. But there are times we, we wonder about these questions. Um, so I would not presume to write a book just about me, assuming everyone wants to read about Dan Gilman, especially if they haven't heard of me. You know? But many people might be interested in this idea of a quest, and it's a bit of a cautionary tale. It offers guidance. Uh, I take people along for the ride of, the four primary mentors I worked with over 20 years, and one I called the professor, one I called the guru. I was with that person almost eight years, on and off. One, the warrior priest, who was a martial arts instructor and a metaphysician. Um, amazing guy. And uh, the fourth was I called the sage. And they represent different aspects in the search for enlightenment, illumination, peace, liberation, um, the transcendent search. Uh, so it's been said many ways um, in search of the miraculous. Uh, mm. you know. So I think that's what we're really looking for when we train in the martial art or we do a sport or we pursue any endeavor. Maybe we're a physicist. We're looking for the edges of reality where, where reality meets a little bit of magic. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the larger quest. You know, I began my, my career kind of searching for ways to create more talent for sport. Uh, when I was an athlete and then a coach, I asked myself, well, is talent in, innate? or can be developed. And I define talent, Jeremy, as uh, the ability to learn faster and easier and higher potential, rise to higher levels. That, that seemed like a good definition of talent. And it seemed to me that talent was about 20% innate, certain body types, physical characteristics, uh, psychological characteristics, mm -hmm. might lead one to some innate talent inborn, born under the right stars, whatever. But it seemed to me that about 80% of talent for sports could be developed. And I asked myself, if it could be developed, what, what qualities do you need to learn faster and easier and rise to higher levels? 
well, strength, obviously, muscular control. Mm -hmm. Even if you're a violinist, you need muscular control. Sure. Um, and suppleness, range of motion, proper posture and range of motion. Um, and then stamina to be able to train and so on. But mm -hmm. I think the most important was sensitivity. Uh, elements like coordination, rhythm, timing, balance, reflex speed. So, and of course, the master key to all these is the ability to relax in motion. So, um, my theories, it turned out, worked well in practice. Mm -hmm. when, when freshmen came to train in gymnastics with me at Stanford, um, instead of focusing on new skills in gymnastics, we focused on that foundation of talent, all those qualities. And the theories did bear out in practice. The team went from the bottom of their conference when I began coaching them to one of the top three teams in the nation. And as I may have mentioned, um, I trained the top U.S. Olympians as well. Mm -hmm. And I might still be coaching today, but that's when I realized that being able to do somersaults and cartwheels and handstands, those skills themselves didn't really help me when I went out on a date. <laughs> you know, they didn't help me when I got married or had children or dealt with financial questions or career decisions, the things of everyday life. So that's when I made that fundamental shift. And I started asking bigger questions. How can we develop talent, not for sport or martial arts, if you will, but talent for living? What qualities, what skill sets weren't we taught at school? And that led to a, a well, a lifelong search, the quest for illumination, uh, or just say life skills. And it took me around the world and uh, eventually led me to these four rather unusual mentors who represent radically different people, who represent different aspects of this bigger search in life, the spiritual search. So that's, that's how I made that transition. To, to what I do now. And the, the memoir, A Peaceful Heart, Warrior Spirit, is uh, about the foundational elements of my life that led up to and prepared me for these teachers. Uh, my life as a young athlete and, and yeah. doing martial arts that led to uh, sort of a larger spiritual education. It has nothing to do with religion or beliefs. It was more... Uh, psychophysical training and quite intense that I'm finally able to share in the, the full context in the new book. Mm. One of the things I appreciate about what you just said, the, the number of books of yours that I've read, and, and I guess really the way life unfolds is, is it has to happen in its own time. You talked yes. about the, these four uh, mentors yes. and they couldn't have, come in a different order. They wouldn't have been the same. They wouldn't have had the same lessons. You wouldn't be the same person. And I think so often we look at where we've been and it can be really easy to point to something as, as specific as, you know, I, I could have been better at yesterday's class, yesterday's training. I could have done more at this competition. I wish I had started my martial arts career with this art or this instructor or, 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 or. and yet if you had done it any other way, you wouldn't be where you are. And that's, that's what I'm hearing. That's extremely wise, and I hope you keep that on, on in the program because uh, that's a major contribution. In fact, when I'm asked, what do you want people to take away from your new book, Dan? It, it's that sense of self-trust, trusting ourselves and our process. And it's not comparing ourselves to other people because as soon as we compare ourselves to someone else, we're either going to feel superior or inferior. Mm -hmm. And it's a profound disrespect for our own way of learning and living, our own process, our uniqueness. Because each of us has a story, and it's like no other on the planet in the details of that story. Um, you know, when I was training in gymnastics and teaching, I noticed that some people learn somersaults faster than other people. But mm -hmm. those who took more time to learn it often learned it better than those who learned it quickly. Um, I think it was Lord Chesterfield who once said, I cannot write a book commensurate to Shakespeare, but I can write a book by me. And so I think uh, 
overall in the experiences I share in this book, I hope people will come to a greater sense of perspective and appreciation for their own life and process. And you are quite right that I couldn't have met these mentors in a different order. It wouldn't have made any sense. Um, so yes, one thing prepared me for the next and my failures prepared me for the successes. And that's what I mean by trusting the process. You, you mentioned, say it again, please. Where can people find this book? Uh, the book is published everywhere on all the platforms, okay. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, you know, any uh, online bookstores. It's, it's in stores as well. But more reliably, you know, it's easier to get online. Okay. And, and also, there's an audio version. I recorded the audio book. Oh, you read it. Voice. Oh, great. Yes. And also, it's an e-book, of course. It's out there for the Kindle or the Nook or um, um, iPad, whatever um, yeah. e-readers people have as well. Cool. Awesome. Well, I, I hope people will check it out. I'll be checking it out. And we always end the show as the guest wants to. So this is your chance to talk to the however many martial artists are listening right now. What final words do you want to send them away with? Well, first of all, anybody who is training in the martial arts, I want to congratulate you uh, um, because based on my experience, it, it can be a tremendously positive experience, um, but it will teach you about self-trust. Uh, if, if there's a perturbation, if there's problems, don't, don't be shy about exploring different teachers. Don't feel locked in. Martial arts is not a religion. Um, it is a, it's a practice um, and uh, explore different, different, try different arts. Even if you're committed to one, uh, go to a seminar in another art, just to explore and see how it enriches your perspective on the art that you've chosen. Uh, and again, no best art, just the best for you at a given time of life. So that can change over time as well. Um, but I, I do congratulate you. I feel like a, a kindred spirit of anyone who studied martial arts or any form of, of movement. So uh, my heart goes out to you. I have to say, being able to speak to Dan Millman on martial arts radio is nothing short of a dream come true. This man's had a tremendous amount of influence in my life. And the fact that I got to speak with him and then also bring that conversation to all of you means everything. So, Dan, thanks for coming on the show. I really, really appreciate it. Stacy, thank you for helping to make this happen. And to all of you, thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. And I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you want to go deeper on this episode, we've got all the show notes. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. There's a separate page for each and every episode that we do. and. I hope that if you have never checked out any of Dan Millman's books, you'll consider doing so after today's conversation. Remember, we get no kickback. So I'm doing that simply because I know the power that his books have had for me. And I suspect some of you out there may also find similar benefit. If you want to support us, if this episode, other episodes, the things that we do mean something to you, whistlekick.com slash family. That's the place to go for the full list of things you can do to support us in our mission, whether you check out one of our training programs or whatever else. If you buy something at whistlekick.com, you've got the code podcast15 to use. And if you've got suggestions, feedback, things that you want us to consider doing, people to talk to, subjects to tackle, let's hear them. Jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick, as you might expect. And that brings today to a close. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.